This is a program that discusses issues of faith for people looking for answers. This is Viewpoint with Bob Placey. With massive changes in the Supreme Court, can the rulings on Roe v. Wade and prayer in school be reversed after years of fighting at the nation's top court? Well, today we talk to the founder of the Freedom Foundation, attorney Alan Parker. He's taken on this uphill battle. And I'll speak to him about his mission and how he's on the front line of this massive task of reversing some of the most controversial decisions ever made by the Supreme Court. We founded the Justice Foundation to litigate for the right of parents to control the education of their children and have the funding follow the child to the school of the parent's choice. And the Supreme Court, we've been working on that in Texas for a long time. The Supreme Court actually upheld that in 1995 in a case called, uh, no, 2005, excuse me, uh, Harris v. Zellman, they upheld the Cleveland voucher program and uh, said, it's not an establishment of religion if you pay for every child's education and some of them want to go to religious schools, that's okay. And the Supreme Court in just this very last term even held that to a greater degree when they reversed the decision of the Montana Supreme Court, which had excluded religious schools from a tax scholarship program. And they said that's discrimination against religion, and you cannot discriminate by excluding religious schools from a general program. So. We have a very good argument today, and I think one of the ways to restore God's law to America is to teach God's children what God's law is. Uh, when you place your child in a public school, you're not going to get a God-centered, Christ-centered education. They, they're not allowed by the current Supreme Court to do that. Now, you're, you're an attorney, yet I saw a video of you yesterday. It sounded, uh, when I watched it, I thought, no, you're, you're a pastor is what you are. You're, you're, you're a prophet calling for repentance. I saw that video on you calling for repentance. Why do you feel that so deeply as an attorney? I mean, you don't think of attorneys as calling people to repentance necessarily. I mean, you're trying, you're litigating cases. Why do you feel that so, di so deeply with the work you're in now? We, we have tried to make a better society for 27 years, but... I have come to the conclusion that without massive repentance, we are doomed as a nation. I believe, as I've read the Bible, that we've committed the four great sins that bring national destruction, and eventually will, though God is long-suffering and gives plenty of time to repent, there are certain things he cannot allow to go on forever. He would not be a just God if he did. And the four great sins are, number one, forsaking God. And our nation was built on a voluntary covenant that we entered into with God to honor God and to be a Christian nation with religious liberty. And we forsook God in the 1960 school, sure. 1962 school prayer case. Then the second great sin that brings national destruction is shedding innocent blood wow. yeah. on a massive scale. And that's abortion, which started in 1973 as a supposed constitutional right. And today I'm spending a lot of my time to reverse Roe v. Wade. But the third great national sin is to um, sh uh, sexual immorality on a vast scale. And we've engaged in that throughout the nation. And the fourth is greed, because even the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah was that they were careless and arrogant, didn't help the poor, and they committed abominations, according to the book of Ezekiel. So God is saying to America right now, America, return to me, and I will return to you. And he says that about 37 times in the Bible to his people. Return to me. Your sins are so terrible. If you don't return, I've got to do something because I love you. And the judgments of God are merciful and correct it. And even in the New Testament, Jesus said, be zealous therefore to repent, for I discipline and chasten those I love. And that's in the book of Revelation. And by the way, I am a license, about three years ago, I became a licensed minister also. So I'm licensed before the Supreme Court, and I'm licensed to preach the gospel. Well, we want to talk about one of those things that, that you're continually pushing uh, to go before the Supreme Court, and that's uh, 
That's the uh, reversal of Roe versus Wade. And uh, I'm going to talk about moral outcry and the history of that and the status of it and, and how, you, how you can con continually carry that before the court, what it takes to get it before the court, and uh, uh, what it's going to take to, to see Roe v. Wade. Is it even possible to get it reversed? I believe it is possible, and I believe actually a lot of this turmoil that our whole nation is in is uh, part of God turning America around, and he's allowing these things to shake us up. Uh, even uh, about 75% of religious people in America think God is trying to get our attention, and even about 25% of secular people think <laughs> God is trying to get our attention. So. Uh, so he is, and I believe I have the great honor of representing uh, right now, Melinda Tebow, who is the founder of the Moral Outcry Petition. And the Moral Outcry Petition is a petition to the United States Supreme Court to reverse its own Supreme Court cases on abortion. In 1973, it said abortion was a constitutional right, but it's not. That's just a decision of the Supreme Court They've overturned and reversed their own cases over 200 times. And why a petition to the Supreme Court? Because under the Constitution, we have a right mm -hmm. to petition the government for redress of grievances. And who is it that created this grievance? It's the Supreme Court. It wasn't the legislatures. It wasn't the states. It the Supreme Court created this grievance. So how do we file the mm -hmm. petition? We do it through amicus curiae, or friend of the court briefs, in abortion cases. And the last one we filed, we had 336,214 names of people like you mm -hmm. who are watching this today. They went to the moraloutcry.com, they signed the petition, and then we make five legal arguments, but we put their name in the footnote of a brief. Uh, in a drop box. And so their name is recorded at the U.S. Supreme Court. And there's a number of times where the Bible says he makes a book of remembrance for those who fear the Lord about what they're doing. It's in Zechariah, for example, and Malachi. I don't know quite for sure how he does that, but I know that the Justice Foundation will put your name in the brief. And if we could, I could I'd like to go over the five arguments yeah, that I, we're making. I want to hear that because the, the, the five arguments are very uh, integral to the Supreme Court understanding that they, they can and should reverse themselves. They have in the past, and, and that should happen. But uh, anything else that, that you, you need to do to get this petition, you would attach that to any abortion case that goes before the Supreme Court, but they have to hear one first, right? So you can't just give them the petition. Yes, but... Right. Uh, they, uh, we did try it when we had 54,000 and they rejected yeah. the petition. Though people can write, write the Supreme Court if they'd like to write the judges a letter or something to citizens. But legally, we present it through appropriate briefs. Now, there's 10 or 15 cases on their way to the Supreme Court right now from ones that were recently heard, like a Louisiana case where they just had hospital admitting privileges. Mm -hmm. Or a Mississippi case we just filed a brief in where they're banning all abortion after 15 weeks. Two things like the heartbeat bills, which six or seven states have passed, that would pretty much ban all abortion. And we don't know which case it will be that could reverse Roe v. Wade, but it could be any of those cases. There's no silver bullet. It could be any time the other side, side is saying, you can't do that because of Roe v. Wade. The Supreme Court could say, hmm, you're right, we're going to reverse Roe v. Wade and uphold this law. So that's why we're continuing to collect signatures. We want to have over a million eventually. And we're making five legally persuasible, legally defensible, publicly persuadable reasons. And I think your audience needs to know it so they can sure. get into public debate. Yeah. And what, what are those five tenets, the five things that that first of all are necessary to show the Supreme Court that they can do it, they've done it in the past, and that it should be done uh, as a moral responsibility. What, what are those five? Yes. The number one is abortion is a crime against humanity. Mm -hmm. That is a serious, egregious get their attention. wrong. Like it should. Yeah. And this is a kind of a miracle of God that is based on Section 47D of a book called 
the law of judicial precedent that was co-authored by eight judges, and two of them were Justices Gorsuch and Ken, uh, Kavanaugh when they were at the Court of Appeals level. So they've written a book on how to reverse Supreme Court precedent, and now two of them are on the court. And one of the first things, things is, it's not just wrong, it's seriously, egregiously wrong, grievously, all right? So we call it a crime against humanity, like slavery and like segregation. And we remind them of one of their best cases called Brown v. Board of Education, where they ended segregation, even though it was 58 years old, and Roe was only about 47 years old, and they reversed a lot of social policy, but they did it because it was the right thing to do. And this last case, in a case called Apodaca, Justice Kavanaugh said, that Brown v. Board of Education was the single greatest decision of the Supreme Court because it reversed the 58-year-old president. So it's almost like he was reading our brief. But anyway, then the second thing, uh, the second big argument is new evidence shows that life begins at conception. The court said in 1973 itself, we don't know when life begins. So under the law of precedence, when science changes, the law changes. Mm -hmm. Now we know from DNA testing and human genome project and other things, it's a human being from the moment of conception. Human mothers and human fathers produce human children. But there's a lot of new science. Seems, seems simple, but it is science. Yeah. And the third argument is that abortion hurts women. The court thought it was helping women. And yet now... We filed part of the Operation Outcry is a project of the Justice Foundation. We have over 4,600 testimonies of women hurt by abortion. We filed them in the briefs at the Supreme Court, in addition to the moral outcry signers. And if one of your uh, listeners has had an abortion, they can tell their story. We'll protect their identity and tell the Supreme Court that abortion hurt them, too. They can do that at the justicefoundation.org. Um, and they can sign the moral outcry petition at the moral outcry moraloutcry.com. Mm -hmm. So then the fourth reason is a change in circumstances. No the the baby Moses laws or safe haven laws in all fifty states uh -huh. means no woman has to take care of a baby she doesn't want. Today we could say to a woman, don't kill the baby, don't hurt yourself, give us the baby through your state safe haven laws. All 50 states have them. Even liberal states like California and New York say, give us the baby within a set period of time after birth, drop it off at a fire station or a hospital usually, no questions asked, no legal procedure, no cost, mm -hmm. unlike abortion. So it's free. Don't kill the baby. Don't hurt yourself. Give us the baby. baby. And you don't have to care about that. Legally, Bob, there are no unwanted children in America it anymore. Be. The mother the mother doesn't want the baby. But here's the fifth argument. The state will take the baby, so the state wants the baby. And then what will happen to those babies if six hundred thousand of them are turned over? Well, there's one to two million women every year waiting to adopt newborn babies. That's just the scientific fact. It's new. You could Google infertility and find out how many women are infertile. Shockingly, 10% of American women are infertile. And after a while, about two, that's six million infertile women every year. And after a while, up to two million of them say, I'd like to adopt a baby. So it's the love, love, love solution, Bob. Love the baby and justice for the baby. Don't kill the baby. It's mercy for the mother. If you can't take care of the baby, we will. You can be free. This also eliminates what the court calls the reliance interest. In 1992, we had five judges who thought and had written that Roe v. Wade was wrongly decided. But they didn't reverse it because they said, Women have come to rely upon this to be free of childcare. Well, now, starting in 1999, a new major change. A woman can be free of a perceived burden 
we believe children are our blessings, and so do yeah. all those women who want to adopt those little blessings. So it's a win, win, win for everybody. And I believe if we reverse it, God hates the shedding innocent blood. It can stop the judgment. For, uh, and if there's enough repentance and we change our ways, God longs to forgive us. Relent, yeah. Individually, if, you, if a woman or a man has participated in abortion, it's not the unforgivable sin, Bob. And there are resources on our website to help get them to free Christ-centered abortion recovery programs. In a moment, we'll continue our interview with Alan Parker, and he's going to share with us how you build a case to reverse a decision on the Supreme Court. As the climate in our world grows more hostile toward our Christian worldview, Viewpoint is a program designed to help defend our faith. Each week, Bob Placey interviews guests who bring the Bible into focus. And we can be salt and light in this culture. Every description of Babylon in this book is going to come to pass. Helping us understand how relevant God's Word is for today. Viewpoint is completely viewer supported. If you've enjoyed and benefited from our interviews, we would ask you to consider helping us by supporting it financially. Your 20, 50, or even $100 monthly gift will help us continue to bring you more of these programs. Go to WTLW.com now and click Get Involved or you can send a check to the address on your screen. Thank you for supporting Viewpoint. Not only can you watch Viewpoint each week, but you can also listen to it on demand as a podcast. You can go to WTLW.com and under videos, click Viewpoint, and you'll see the selection of interviews. You can also subscribe by searching for Viewpoint with Bob Placey on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. And remember to share the podcast with your friends. Give you this the stamina to go. I mean, how many times have you? Maybe I shouldn't ask. How many times you've you've submitted briefs before the court, and what gives you the stamina to go on and say this could be the one? I've got to, um, th this case has come up. They what well, they have nine thousand cases a year submitted to the free Supreme Court, and they hear ninety. What gives you this, the, the right. hope and the stamina to think this is the one? We're gonna we're gonna nail it with this one. Well, it's the scripture the Lord gave me when he called us to do this project. I said, we started out with school choice. The first seven years, we kind of did limited government, free markets, private property, parental rights, which school choice is the epitome of that. But in 2000, I began to rep have the chance to represent in women injured by abortion and actually to represent Norma McCorvey, wow. who was the Roe of Roe v. Mm -hmm. Wade, the case that brought abortion to America and Sandra Kano, who was the Doe of Doe v. Bolton, the companion case to Roe v. Wade. So I met Norma at a march for life, and I'm flying back from that plane, the idea came to me that Norma and Sandra could file motions to set aside their own case. And, you know, sometimes you get these ideas, Bob, and then you better say, well, Lord, is that is really, really you? you? Is that really you? Yeah. And so I prayed... 30 days and got my board praying and my wife praying and uh, my wife was uh, putting up some books in the homeschool library for the co-op and found a little book called The Bed's Too Short and Other Spiritual Essays and it brought my attention to Isaiah 20 and uh, Isaiah 28 20 and the next morning I looked at the passage of scripture and this is the scripture that has sustained me. Isaiah 28, verses 14 to 22. So God says to the mocking judges who rule my people in Jerusalem, behold, you've made a covenant with death, an agreement with the grave. You don't think the overwhelming scourge will reach you because you've covered yourself with fraud and deception. And your reaction was what I had. Wow. wow. That's what Roe no yeah. A covenant with death. So then God goes on to say, I'm going to make justice the measuring line and righteousness the plumb line. 
Hail will sweep away the refuge of lies, and your covenant with death will be annulled. The agreement with the grave will not stand. And I later found out that the abolitionist of slavery had called Dred Scott a covenant with death, an agreement with the grave, based on this very same scripture that God gave. And, and it is the same sin. Mm -hmm. We're treating mm -hmm. some human being as less than a human being. Right. It, it's the same sin of any time we don't. That's why it's a crime against humanity, which is when the government withdraws legal protection from a class of human beings. Yeah. So I have the promise of God that he will do it. And let me just say this one last encouraging thing. In about verse 18, it says, for I, the Lord, will rise up as at Mount Perizim. I'll be stirred up as in the Valley of Gibeon to do my amazing work, my extraordinary work, my unusual and alien task. Wow. <laughs> and he says, now, don't you put on as a scoffer or your chains will be made stronger. So I've been waiting for that. We need to pray for him and we need to pray for our poor. Um, yep. I know you're. this is a Christian TV station, so... Pray for those in authority, but don't forget the court when you do that. Mm -hmm. And we don't pray enough. Pray for the court. They, they're they going to decide this issue. And they're, and so I believe God got Donald Trump elected, and he's putting the right people on the court. And soon, it may still be a fight, but soon, particularly in biblical terms, soon where God's going to end it. Another one last question, because this is this is kind of on our mind and we look at the, the current cultural landscape of, of the United States and the, and the battle lines that have been drawn. If and when Roe v. Wade is overturned the next year, whenever that happens, do you see a social and cultural tsunami coming through this this country that is going to that is going to be unlike anything we've ever seen before as, as far as the sides of this of this issue? What would happen in the United States? All right. Well, but one thing that people often overlook are the safe haven laws. I think the safe haven laws are a social safety net. Women won't be quite so freaked out uh, if they know they don't have to care for the baby, mm -hmm. because that's what women really want from abortion. They don't want to kill a child. That's why even the liberals on the court said it's a difficult and painful decision. A woman knows at some deep level though sometimes the young and the naive don't know it and the abortionists lie about it. But uh, the safe haven law will put some of that off. Um, no woman will have to care for a child she doesn't want. In exchange for a few months of pregnancy, the state is giving her 18 years of freedom. And so we can preserve the freedom of Roe v. Wade without killing the baby. I think that will go a lot to amp things down. But there will be a dependent battle. And when you say abortion is a crime against humanity, then it should be outlawed everywhere. Absolutely. And the states will have to battle for that. Some states already have a law that when Roe is overturned, for example, in Louisiana and Arkansas, abortion will it'll be illegal immediately, but women can use the safe haven laws. And Arkansas passed the first law like that based on the moral outcry petition. The day Roe v. Wade is overturned, abortion becomes illegal in Arkansas. And if your listeners, well, uh, you know, if your listeners, wherever they are, are in a state with a pro-life governor, pass a bill outlawing abortion now, the day it's reversed by Roe v. Wade, or when Roe v. Wade is reversed. So if our, our viewers want to, one, sign the Moral Outcry petition, they should go to moraloutcry.com, right? And if they've got a testimony That's to tell, if they've got a, a testimony that they want to become legally, uh, presented before the Supreme Court that where abortion has hurt them, male or female, uh, you know, it could be a father or a mother. And they can tell us how to protect their identity. We'll either use first names only, mm -hmm. uh, full name or initials only, if that's what they want. Well, Alan, thank you so much. Thank you for your work. And thank, <laughs> thank you for just hanging in there and, and continuing to carry the battle. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's not enough to say we oppose the position of our government. We have an obligation to make our voice heard and take action. We encourage you to connect with the Justice Foundation. As the climate in our world grows more hostile toward our Christian worldview, Viewpoint is a program designed to help defend our faith. 
Each week, Bob Placey interviews guests who bring the Bible into focus. And we can be salt and light in this culture. Every description of Babylon in this book is going to come to pass. Helping us understand how relevant God's Word is for today. Viewpoint is completely viewer supported. If you've enjoyed and benefited from our interviews, we would ask you to consider helping us by supporting it financially. Your 20, 50, or even $100 monthly gift will help us continue to bring you more of these programs. Go to WTLW.com now and click Get Involved or you can send a check to the address on your screen. Thank you for supporting Viewpoint. Next week, we're going to meet a man who says he doesn't have enough faith to be an atheist. In the book, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist, we use what we call the roadrunner tactic because mm -hmm. it reminds us, and this is for the, the people that are as old as I am, you know, <laughs> Wiley Coyote oh, yeah. and Roadrunner. You know, Wiley Coyote would always stop short, or Roadrunner would stop short of the cliff, and Wiley Coyote would oh, go God. past him and be hanging in midair until he realized he had no ground to stand on. And that's what you can do with people who utter self-defeating yeah. statements. You can show them their claim has no ground to stand on. We, we've got to tactic. start with truth. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've got to start at that point. And then you go from there, you, you go into, if there's truth. The next question is, does God, does God exist? exist? Is it true that God exists? Yeah. And uh, th that's the second question we cover. And we give evidence that God exists. And the three major arguments we give for God's existence, uh, one is from the beginning of the universe. Uh, the second argument is from the design of the universe and the design of life. And the third argument is from morality, the, 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 the idea that there's objective right and wrong out there. If there's no God, nothing is objectively right and wrong, but everybody understands certain things are right and other things are wrong. For example, it's right to love, it's wrong to say torture babies for fun, okay? Right. If that's the case, if it's wrong to torture babies for fun, there has to be a standard outside of humanity Otherwise, everything's just a matter of opinion. You know, that's just your opinion against sure. a baby torturer's opinion. And so we point out that with those three arguments, the fact that the universe had a beginning, that things are designed, and that there's an objective moral law and objective moral obligations, mm -hmm. you can arrive at the conclusion that there's a spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful, moral, personal, intelligent creator who created all things and sustains all things. Dr. Frank Turk's going to join me. We'll dive into the arguments of why our faith can be defended much easier than that of atheists or agnostics. If you enjoy this program, I encourage you to support it financially at WTLW.com. We depend on your financial support to make this program possible, and thank you for watching. Remember, you can watch the interviews you've seen today on demand on YouTube. Plus, you can also listen to all of our episodes on the Viewpoint with Bob Placey podcast on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere you listen to a podcast.